Good evening, this is Pastor Dominique from Evander Revival Center. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to a word from the Lord that I believe is going to bless you, encourage you, possibly even bring conviction to your life. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. As we go into the word of God, I've got a question. And I'm going to be speaking about a parable that Jesus taught. But the question is very important. Are you a good investment for God? Are you a good investment for God? I'm not asking, are you saved? I'm not asking, are you faithful? I'm asking, are you a good investment for God? If God had to invest in you, the riches of his kingdom, spiritual blessings, will there be a return on investment? Now, none of us, not one of us, will take money and constantly invest it into a scheme that results in us making a loss. None of us would. And we are humans and we wouldn't do that. How can we expect God to continually invest, continually bless, if there is no return on investment? So, maybe you're praying and you're asking God, God, please bless me in this area. Open up a door for me. Lord, Father God, I'm asking you for uh, you to use me in a greater way. But it just feels as if God is not answering your prayers the way that you would like him to. Tonight I want to speak a little bit about that and I want to do a teaching from a parable that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 13. And it's the parable of the sower. Now this teaches us what it means to be fertile for God's investment. So that God can invest in us and that we can become fruitful for his kingdom. Now... As we go into the, uh, into Matthew chapter 13, I want to read a couple of scriptures and then we're going to talk around this and I'm going to teach you around this. So I want you to open up your heart to receive the word. Listen to what Matthew chapter 13 says from verse 16 right down to verse 23. Matthew chapter 13 verse 16 down to verse 23. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you, I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, another translation says on rocky places, this is he who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful but he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word understands it and who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold some 60 some 30 now if we study the gospels we come to understand that jesus christ was an exceptional leader and a phenomenal preacher there was just something extraordinary about Jesus. The way he would minister. In fact, Jesus preached up on mountains. He preached in deserts. He even preached from boats. He would communicate the secrets of the kingdom of God. And 
Whenever Jesus was finished preaching, the people would look at one another and say, Who is this man that preaches with such authority and such power? There was something special about Jesus that made him stand out from the preachers in the society that he was in. That people were drawn to Jesus. And even when he stopped preaching, people didn't always want to go away. In fact, in one passage of scripture, Jesus was preaching in a wilderness. And the Bible says he was preaching to 5,000 men and their families. Now, Jewish families don't just have one or two children. They had many children, especially in the biblical context of where Jesus was ministering. And if the Bible says there were 5,000 men with their wives and their children, you could estimate there was close to 20, 30,000 people. This was almost enough to fill up a modern day stadium. And yet they stood before Jesus who had no sound system, who had no technology, and just by the authority and the anointing that was upon his life, when he ministered, they were captivated by what he said. And they sat all day, all day listening to Jesus. And they did not want to depart when Jesus finished speaking. That's how phenomenal Jesus was in his ministry. How dynamic he was. And we know, according to Acts chapter 10 verse 38, it's because the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was anointed with the Spirit of God and he went around doing wonders. So Jesus, in the way that he communicated and the way that he preached, in being effective, he told stories in the form of parables. Now, parables were stories that Jesus told on a regular basis. He would share a parable. Now, what is a parable? A parable is a short story that teaches a moral attitude or a principle about the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. A parable is a short story that teaches, sorry about that. I see we've got some sound issues here. A parable is a short story that teaches a moral attitude or a principle about the kingdom of God. Now the reason why Jesus taught in parables is because in the parable would be revelation or principle that the people that were listening, that were hungry to hear about the kingdom of God, could go and apply that to their lives. Jesus, in fact, says that he spoke in parables. The purpose for that was to keep hidden the mysteries of the kingdom of God from the stubborn and the lazy. But to give revelation to those who hunger for truth and righteousness. Now in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, Jesus gave a promise. If you hunger for truth and righteousness, you will be filled. So that's why Jesus taught in parables. Now he comes and he speaks to the multitudes, to the people that are following him, about a parable about a sower. And in fact, I want to read it. Jesus speaks about a man, a farmer that went out and sowed seed. Now listen to what he says. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3, right down to verse 9. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. In other words, there was a pathway. A walkway. That's what it is to have a wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Devoured the seed. Okay. Verse 5. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up. But because they had no depth of earth. The, the, sorry. Let me say that again. Verse 5. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. Verse 6. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then Jesus says in verse 9. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, that's quite a strange statement to make if you think about it, because Jesus is saying, he who has ears, let him hear. All of us have got ears. 
All of us have got physical ears. I've got ears. You've got ears. But none, not all of us have got spiritual ears that hear. Did you know you could hear physically, but be deaf spiritually, so to speak? Jesus says, let him who has ears hear. Now, I've come to understand when it comes to leadership in ministry, the way you communicate is crucial. Because what you say is important. But sometimes what is more important is how the person understands what you say. So it's not enough just to communicate in leadership, but you've got to make sure that who you're communicating to understands what you say. You can communicate without understanding. You could blurt out words and the person who's listening to you is not hearing what you say. I've seen this in doing marriage counseling, how a couple will be communicating to one another. They listening to one another, but they not hearing one another. You can listen to what I say, but not hear what I say. That's why Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Let him hear. In other words, let him come to a place of understanding. Now, when I ask you, are you a good investment for God? What we've got to understand to become a good investment for God or to become fertile ground to be fruitful for God's kingdom. According to this parable, it is based upon the fact of how we hear and how we receive God's word. And I'm going to show you in a moment. There are four types of people. When the word of God comes to them. There are four types of people. With four different responses. Different lifestyles. The way you and I. Hear. Will determine our success. Or it could even be a limitation on our success. So how I hear and how I understand will dictate whether I become fruitful, productive, a good return on investment for God. Because I'm telling you right now, God wants to invest in you. That's why you're listening to this message. You that is listening right now, my brother, my sister, the fact that you are listening, God is speaking to you through me and he is telling you, I want to invest in your life. I want to bless you in such a radical way that you are blessed to be a blessing. That you are so blessed that other people come and eat from your well or drink from your well and eat from your tree. Don't you want to be blessed like that in such a radical way that other people are blessed just knowing you? Blessed just being around you? So... Why God is going to want to invest blessings into you. God wants to bless you in a radical way. But it, we have to be fertile ground. We have, to be, we have to be fertile for God to invest in us. But that starts by how we hear. Not just how we listen, but how we hear. Do you know, I can listen to many sounds. I can listen to many voices in a crowd. But there are certain voices that I will only hear. That's called selective hearing. Now, there is so much noise in this world. We live in a very noisy world. We are bombarded with information 24-7. Social media has now just overtaken our lives. And we have to be careful that the noise of this world does not drown out the word of God or God speaking to us in a divine way. We have to be so careful that the noise of this world does not drown out the prophetic voice of God towards us. And we have to be extra sensitive to listen and hear what God is saying to us. Hear what God is saying to us, not just as the body of Christ, but as individuals. 
Do you know, I could speak a word. I could speak a word. And there are a lot of people that listen to the word. But not everybody hears the word. In fact, Jesus comes and tells us that the farmer in the story that goes out to sow the seed in Mark chapter 4 verse 14. Those are preachers. Preachers of the word. Even Jesus Christ himself was a preacher. Those are the preachers, the people that are called and chosen of God to preach the word of God. They are the ones that understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And God reveals the secrets unto them so that they can communicate it unto his flock, unto his people, unto his children. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 25 verse 14, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. If you want God to communicate to you in an intimate way, to reveal things unto you, to open up his word and give you rhema revelation, it starts by fearing him, having reverential respect and admiration towards God. The fear of the Lord. I'm not talking about the spirit of fear. I'm talking about the respect side where you respect God. You've got reverential fear towards God. So Jesus says that the, the farmer that sows the seed is preachers, Mark chapter 4 verse 14. But the seed, according to Luke chapter 8 verse 11, is God's word. Is God's word. So, yeah, Jesus says that the farmer comes and he sows seed. And it falls on four different types of soils. Now the soils represent four different types of people. The seed gets sown, but it does not yield success on every piece of ground that it falls. In fact, the success ratio in this passage of scripture is 25%. 25%. Think about that. One out of four people will actually become productive once the seed of God's word is sown. And my job tonight and the purpose of this teaching is to make sure that you are a part of that 25%. That you come to your harvest. That you produce your harvest. That you're not like Israel in Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 10 where God said that his word, that Israel could not hear God's word as a result of being uncircumcised in their hearing. They had uncircumcised ears. Now when I say uncircumcised ear according to that context it means that they had fleshly ears they were they were stuck in the flesh they were listening to man and listening to man's opinion so much that they that had no regard for God's word and as a result God says that they could not hear God's word because they had uncircumcised ears let that never be said about you and me in fact, we need to pray, God, circumcise my ears that I may hear the things of the Spirit, that I may hear your voice, that I may not just hear but understand what you are saying. That you, Lord, when you speak to me, that I will hear and understand. Make that your prayer. Say, Lord, speak to me that I may hear and understand. Uncircumcise my ears. Sorry, circumcise my ears, Lord, not uncircumcise my ears. So, in this passage of scripture, the seed that is sown, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the seed. Think about this. Because the seed fell on soil that did not produce harvest. Three out of the four soils did not produce harvest. The seed is the word. There's nothing wrong with the word. In fact, even in this passage of scripture, the disciples did not understand the parable. They did not understand what Jesus was saying. And Jesus is perfect in all his ways. So when Jesus was speaking, there was a lack of understanding, hearing what Jesus was saying. And we know that there was nothing wrong with Jesus. So what was wrong? Where's the fault? It's in the soil. It's in he that listens to the word. It's in she that listens to the word. Now, I want to share these four different types of soils, break it down for you. And I want you 
to do introspection as I'm speaking. Now, you could say you're good soil. But your life will testify what soil you are. In fact, your history will testify what soil you are. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about a pattern of behavior. I'm talking about a way of thinking, a mindset. Now, as I'm sharing this, ask yourself, am I that soil? Does my life reflect that? If it does. And the Holy Spirit brings conviction. Praise God. Use that as an opportunity to change, improve and become better. Listen, all of us need the word of God. I need the word of God. When the word of God comes to me, it's there to help me to become better, to improve, to adjust, even to repent. So that I can come under the blessing and walk in the fullness of God. Now, that's the purpose of me preaching as well, is for you to understand where you need to change, where you need to improve, so that you can come under the blessing of God, so that you can experience the goodness of God. Now, let's look at the first soil. Jesus said, the farmer goes and he sows the seed, and the seed fell, some of it fell on the wayside. This was a walkway. This is where there are a lot of people walking. And then he says, and the birds came up and devoured the seed. Now, the walkway represents the busyness of life. There's a lot of traffic. There's a lot of walking up and down. The birds are symbolic of Satan and his demons. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says that he is the prince of the air. That's why we see a lot of disturbance in the weather. Why? Because that's where Satan rules. He's the prince of the air. So when Jesus says the seed fell on the walkway, he's speaking about how people hear the word. Oh, sorry, they listen to the word. And as they listen to the word, the devil comes and he snatches up the word immediately. Or life is so busy, the word has no effect. In fact, it does not take root in their hearts. Have you ever been, let me explain it. Have you ever been to church and you've listened to a sermon and you've heard what that pastor has said? And when you left somebody else that was with you, it was as if the word had no effect on them. You were so blessed, but they were just so oblivious to the blessing or the revelation that was spoken. What happened? The birds, so to speak, came and snatched up the word. I've seen how people will walk out of the church and they will go out of the church. They will sit. They will listen. They will walk out of the church and it's just the same. They're just the same. What happened? The birds, so to speak, came and snatched up the seed. The seed does not take root. The devil comes and steals that seed. They're so busy. They're so busy in this life. Even while they're sitting, listening to the word, they're busy thinking about what they've got to do in the week to come. They're thinking about what they've got to do when they get home. They're thinking about the stuff that they need to complete. They're thinking about deadlines. They're thinking about other situations. They're thinking about problems that they are facing. What is happening? The busyness of life. They're on the walkway. They are stuck in busyness. And the seed, the word of God can have no effect in their lives. Now, when I speak about this group of people, I want to tell you, I've been there. I've been there where there was a season in my life where the word of God, it just felt like it had no effect. When I would go to church, it felt like it had no effect in my life. But why was that? Was there something wrong with the preacher? No. Was there something wrong with the word? No. Was there something wrong with the way the Holy Spirit was illuminating the word or uh, busy speaking to the hearts of the people in the church? No. I was on the pathway. I was stuck in the busyness of life. I was so preoccupied with everything else that I did not make the word of God a priority. And the devil kept snatching up the word, snatching up the word. And let me tell you something. 
If you're going to allow the busyness of life to dominate you in such a way that you cannot consume the word and let it take root in your heart, you're never going to get to your harvest. Look, all of us have got a harvest. All of us have got a promise. All of us are trusting God for something. But that starts with us making a decision that regardless how busy we are, we're going to make God's word a priority. I was ministering on it this week in Joshua chapter 1. God said to Joshua as he was going into the promised land, he said to him, make my word a priority. In fact, he didn't say it in so many words. I'm actually paraphrasing what I understand from that passage of scripture in Joshua chapter 1 from verse 5 right down to verse 9. He said to him, meditate on my word, declare my word, do my word, do what the law of Moses says. Then you will be successful and prosperous. But you see, people that get stuck on the pathway of life, and the reason why the word gets so easily snatched up from them is because they also deceived. They are so quickly deceived. They will hear a word, and then they will get deceived, or they will receive the wrong doctrine, and now they start walking around in deception. Why? Because the devil wants them to be deceived. Because a deceived person cannot have a harvest. In fact, read the Gospels. Jesus constantly warns us in the last day, the number one thing we must watch out for is deception. Is deception. There will be false prophets arising. Constantly false teachers arising. And they will take the word out of context. And they will bring a lot of deception even to the elite of the body of Christ. That's why we've got to constantly make sure the word of God must be our foundation. Not what man says or what man believes or what doctrine man brings forth, but the word of God. Another problem with the people that get stuck on the pathway of life is their perception. They perceive the scripture in a certain way. They are not willing to change or grow in the word of God. They've got a perception and the perception becomes the limitation on their growth. I want to tell you through deception and perception. The devil can steal the seed of God's word right out of your life. That you've got no harvest. These are people that struggle to understand God's word. They listen, but they don't hear. That's why Proverbs chapter 2 verse 4, we are encouraged to seek for understanding like gold and silver. If I told you in your roof, at your house, there is a million rands worth of gold. In a, in a suitcase, in your roof, what would you do? Would you just, just go on with life, not worried about the possible treasure that is hidden in your roof? Or would you immediately do what you can to get into your roof to discover that treasure? Because it's got a lot of value and wealth connected to it. If you don't have a ladder, you will quickly go lend a ladder. If you don't have a means to climb into that roof, you will find a means to climb into that roof. Why? Because it's valuable. Now, we are encouraged, according to Proverbs, to seek for understanding in the same manner. So just because you don't understand something doesn't mean that you must just cast it away. Seek understanding like gold and silver. Don't just... Let the devil come and snatch up the seed of God's word. So the first group is those that fall on a rocky pathway. And the birds of the air come and eat that seed. Number two, the second group of people. And Jesus said, verse 5 of Matthew chapter 13. They fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up. But because they had no depth of earth, but when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because some, and because they had no root, they withered away. These are people that are 
amongst rocky places. There's no depth. There's no opportunity to become rooted. They are rocky people. I want to tell you, rocky people cannot be rooted people. Rocky people are shallow people. They are emotional with no substance. In fact, they get excited. They get happy when they hear the word of God. In fact, Jesus, when he explained it, he said, listen to this, Matthew chapter 13, verse 20. But he who received the seed on rocky places, stony places, this is he who receives the word and immediately receives it with joy. Excited, happy, quick to shout hallelujah and amen. Now, I'm not saying if you shout hallelujah and amen, there's a problem with you and you're a rocky person, not at all. I've seen some very rooted people that love to be vocal when the pastor is preaching. But these are emotional people. They get excited. They have get this uh, spiritual high. They go to church and they amped up and they're excited about life. And man, they, they just want to take the world for Jesus. But then they get home. And the first problem they face. Or the little bit of persecution that they encounter. They just lose their joy. And there is no root system. They develop no root. In fact, rocky people have got a big problem with loyalty and commitment. They've got a big problem with loyalty and commitment. Now, you can always tell who's a rocky person. Just look at their track record. Just look at their track record. A rocky person does not get rooted. They jump from one place to one place to another place. They go from one job to another job to another job. They go from one church to another church to another church. They will change gyms. They will go from one diet to another diet. They are constantly living by their emotions. They are constantly looking for hype. They are not seeking to become rooted, to become planted. To be committed. It's all emotion with no substance. Now, I'm Italian. And Italians can be very passionate. In fact, we can be very emotional in our nature. And with that being said, Italians, a lot of them have got great substance. A lot of them don't have enough substance. And I've had to learn to make sure that my emotions are attached to substance, that I'm rooted in that which I believe. That I do not just conform to this world so that I can avoid persecution. I need to be rooted in my values and what I believe. Now, for me, loyalty is a big thing. It's a big thing. And to God, loyalty is a big thing. In fact, uh, I believe it's in James chapter 4, which says, if you are friends with the world, you are actually an enemy with God. In other words, if you're going to be loyal to the world, you're being disloyal to God. So for God, being loyal to Him and to His ways is a big thing. When you are rocky, when you are, the, when you are a rocky person, when God's word comes to you, it has no root in your life. And as a result, there can be no harvest. It's time that we look past our emotions and we choose to become rooted. That we don't just go from one church to another church, from one relationship to another relationship, from one job to another jo job. But that we endure problems, that we endure persecution, and that we don't allow problems and persecution to limit our growth and to prevent our harvest. I want to tell you, rocky people, they will make your life miserable. Rocky people, because... They will take you on an emotional roller coaster and they will just leave you high and dry. They will, they one day up, the next day they down. They yo yo Christians, up and down. And when you've got a rocky person that you marry to, that's a big problem. In fact, it can be a frustration. That's why we need to have a transformation. But that starts with the renewing of the mind. Romans chapter 12 verse 2. 
Rocky people, you can be saved. But you still have a big problem being rooted. Being saved and rooted is not the same thing. Are you a rocky person or are you a rooted person? And you know who can answer that? Your pastor, your boss, your spouse, your friends. You can't keep changing relationships and change your commitment or your commitments based upon how you feel and expect to be rooted. I am committed to certain people, to my church, to my family. I am rooted, not based upon how I feel. I can feel sick, but if somebody needs me, I'll be there for them. Why? Because I'm rooted. I want to be rooted. I'm practicing to be rooted. Why? Because I want a harvest. But I cannot have a harvest if I'm a rocky person. If I'm soil with rocks. With no depth. So the first group is the rocky pathway where the birds come and eat up the seed. The second group is those that are shallow soil amongst rocks. Rocky people. The third group are thorny people. In fact, let's listen to what Jesus said about the thorny people. He says these words, verse 7. And some fell among thorns, some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. So thorny people, Jesus actually defined this for us, are those that hear the word of God, but the worries of this life and the lure of wealth prevent them from being fruitful. So they actually hear what God says. And some of them even understand what the word says. But so quickly, the worries of life and the lure of wealth stunts their growth or holds them back from being fruitful. Now, I've seen this over and over and over again. How some people can come to church, pray and ask God to help them in the area of provision or help them with a job or help them with a contract. And God blesses them and then they just go. And all of a sudden they are so busy with that which they prayed for and that which God blessed them. They are so busy with the blessing they forget about the blesser. They're so busy with the thorns of this world. And later on they become thorny themselves. In fact thorny people are those that are still stuck. You could say under the curse of Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 to 19. Where they're going to have to work by the sweat of their brow. And the ground will just produce thorns and thistles for them. In fact they are the people like. What Job was speaking about in Job chapter 5 verse 5. Their harvests are stolen and their wealth satisfies the thirst of many, but not themselves. They work, work, work. They're constantly pursuing wealth. In fact, one translation says, the deceitfulness of riches lures them away. They are attracted or tempted by wealth and prosperity. So the word of God can take no root in them and they cannot become fruitful for the kingdom of God. Let me ask you this. If you prayed and God answered every one of your prayers, would you still be fruitful? It's easy to say now, yes. But let God just bless you a little bit. Are you still more dedicated? Uh, are you still as dedicated? Are you still as committed? In fact, do you become more dedicated, more committed? You know, I heard somebody once say, if God gives me an X amount of money, I will tithe on that X amount of money. Well, that X amount of money is not going to come until you start tithing right now. Can God trust you with the money that you've got now? Can he trust you to tithe right now? Can God trust you with prosperity? How do you measure that? How do you measure that trust? It starts with the little that you have. Can you give the little that you have? If you can be trusted with a little, God can give you much. I am convinced that there are many of us that God wants to bless in such a financial way.
but God knows our hearts. He knows that we will be deceived and we will become busy with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. In fact, people that are thorny, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, speaking about them, He said, you can detect them by the way that they act. Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you don't pick grapes from thorn bushes and figs from thistles. They become snobbish. It becomes all about what they've achieved and what they have done. And they need to boast about their accomplishments and what they've done in this world. It's, it's nothing more than the flesh on display. We've got to be careful that we don't become thorny. That we are not thorny people. Thorny people. Thorny people aren't friendly for picking. Why? Because they always, it's always about them. It's about what they've accomplished. It's about what they can accumulate. It's about their credentials, their status. It's about their wealth. Thorny people end up being miserable. Because they come to the realization that wealth cannot satisfy you. Let me tell you something. There is godly wealth and there's worldly wealth. Worldly wealth will make you suicidal. Worldly wealth will make you depressed. Worldly wealth will put you in a pit in life and you will just feel like you are smothered and you cannot breathe. But godly wealth will bring forth joy. Godly wealth will make you a blessing unto others. Godly wealth will bring you peace. That's why we've got to make the distinction between worldly wealth and godly wealth. Godly wealth is everything inside of God's will. When I live according to God's will, then I experience godly wealth. God begins to bless me with wealth that is godly, that's according to His will, according to His plan. But worldly wealth is when I achieve something in a way that is outside of God's will. We see a lot of worldly wealth out there. We see it in the newspapers. We hear it on the news. We read of it on social media. The corruption, the theft that's taking place in government. We see it. In fact, it's you see it with your you see it literally with your own eyes. How people are stealing, how people are robbing, how the, how the leaders in this nation are robbing the population, stealing from them. These are thorny people. There is no uh, morals or values when it comes to wealth. They will do whatever it takes to get wealth. Thorny people. So let's quickly revise again before we go to the last type of person or the last group of people. Number one, the first group of people are like a pathway where the seed falls and then the birds come up and snatch it and eat it. The second group are rocky people. The third group are thorny people. The fourth group, Jesus spoke about them. Listen to this. He says this. Verse 8, Matthew chapter 13. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. I want to ask you, are you good ground? Are you good soil? Don't you want to be good soil for God's kingdom? Don't you want to be fertile for God's kingdom? That if God's word comes to you, that there's a harvest that there's a ROI, a return on investment. I want to be a return on investment. I don't want to be blessed in any way if I cannot be a blessing in return. I don't want to accumulate blessings so that I can be blessed. No, I want to accumulate blessings so that I can be a blessing. To be good ground, this is... It's all about, listen to this, let me, let me read it according to what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 13 verse 23. The good ground is he who receives seed on good ground. He hears the word, understands it, and indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. In other words, Jesus says, you hear the word, you understand it, and then you begin to be productive for God's kingdom. You be productive. Now, 
When I say being productive for God's kingdom, I'm not necessarily talking about going into full-time ministry. Did you know you can be productive for God's kingdom right where you are? Right in your community, at your workplace, in your family. You can be productive for God's kingdom in your school. God is looking for productive people. He's looking for good soil so that he, if he puts his seed, if he invests into that, that there can be a return on that investment, that there can be a harvest. But where does it start? Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. It starts with repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is more than just apologizing. It's a change of behavior. It's a shift in your mindset. You were thinking in one direction. You change completely and you, and you think in the opposite direction. In fact, John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. I want to read it to you. Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. He said these words. He says this. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree who does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And he was speaking to the Pharisees who came to his baptism. And he said to them, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not think to say to yourselves that you are children of Abraham. That you are okay with God. No, you've got to have fruits worthy of repentance. There has to be a change. When you hear the word of God, there must be a change. Did you know it's possible to hear the word of God and not change? It's possible to hear a revelation and it have no effect on you? I don't want that to happen with me. If I listen to a word, I immediately want to apply it. I want to know where I can apply it to my life. How can it become applicable? How can I make it personal? Why? Because I want to be good Soil for God's kingdom. But it also starts with being fruitful. Now, it starts with having the Holy Spirit dwell on the inside of you. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 to 23. It's having the fruits of the Spirit. When you've got the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of you, you become fruitful. This is where the fruits of the Spirit are evident in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is where people can see that Jesus is in your life. Marie Wilder says this is where a heart change must take place. I agree. I agree 100%. If we're going to be good soil, there needs to be a heart change. I believe why so many Christians are not getting to their harvest is because there is no heart change. There's no change in their heart. They are stubborn. They've got hardened hearts. We need to pray, God, soften my heart. Make my heart fertile. Make my heart fertile. Now, Psalm chapter 1. I want to quickly read this because I want to give you some practical steps on how to become a good soil in God's kingdom. Listen to what Psalm chapter 1 says. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seatful of the scornful. Okay, Psalm chapter 1 verse 1 tells us, Blessed is the man or the woman, blessed is he or she who does not keep bad company. You want to be good soil? What company do you have? Who's influencing you? Who's in your circle? Okay. Ungodly people cannot be in your circle. I'm not saying we should not reach out to the ungodly. We've got to preach the gospel to the ungodly. But it does not mean they must influence us. You cannot walk around with people that have got no reverence for God. Spend your time with people that curse God. People that are stuck in this world and expected not to have an impact on you. You cannot constantly watch movies where people are cursing God. And in fact, there is no fear of the Lord. And expect that not to have an impact or an influence on you. You cannot be constantly feeding yourself, your mind, what you listen to and what you watch. With ungodly uh, resources and materials and, uh, and uh, listening to things that, you know, is just ungodly worldly 
and expect it not to have an influence on you. If you want to be blessed, you have to have the right influences. You have to have godly influences. And I believe you that is watching right now, that's your desire. You want to be blessed, but it starts by having godly influences. Okay? So blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scornful. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. In other words, his delight, her delight, it's in God's word. They delight in God's word. They delight listening to God's word. They delight reading God's word. They delight understanding God's word, applying God's word. And listen to what the Bible says, verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. In other words, when you and I become good soil, when we choose to have, number one, repentance to change. Number two, have the right influences in our lives, godly influences. Number three, to make God's word a priority, to meditate upon God's word, to make it our joy. The Bible says that's where we will become prosperous and we will produce fruit in every season. Don't you want to produce fruit in every season? Now Jesus says there are some that produce 30, 60, 100 fold in return. So there is soil that heeds a 30 fold return. There is soil that heals a 60 fold return. There is soil that heals a 100 fold return. In other words, not all the good soil is equal in its productive, uh, in how it's productive or how fruitful it is. But it has a certain return on investment. 30, 60, 100. Now I want to tell you, you and I have to make a decision that we're not going to compete with fellow brothers and sisters, that we are not going to compete with other people. I might be a 30-fold healed on the investment that God is putting in my life. You might be a 60-fold. Somebody else might be a 100-fold. I'm not going to try and do what you're doing. I just got to work my soil. And just because it doesn't look like your soil doesn't mean that I'm doing it wrong. And just because your, your fruitfulness doesn't look like my fruitfulness doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. You've just got to work the soil that you've got to work. And I've got to work the soil that I've got to work. And if you understand this principle, it will set you free. Because you'll focus on what God has called you to do and what God has graced you to do. And not what God has graced or called somebody else to do. I want to tell you, my goal is not to become the best preacher on Facebook. My goal is not to be the best preacher on YouTube. My goal is not to be the best preacher in this world. My goal is to be the best me that I can be. I want to be the best father that I can be. I want to be the best husband that I can be. I want to be the best pastor that I can be. I don't intend to be the best pastor in my district or in my region. No. If somebody else is better at being a pastor than me, God bless him. God bless her. I just want to be the best me that I can be. I want to work my soil so that I can produce my crops. And I might be busy right now in this season with a 30-fold return. Who knows, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, I will get to my 100-fold return or my 100-fold investment. But I'm working my soil. I don't know about you, but I'm working my soil. And I just want to make sure that the Satan is not coming up and snatching up the word and I'm getting busy with life and I'm, for, and I'm not allowing the word of God to take root in my life. I want to make sure I'm not a rocky or thorn, a thorny person. No, I want to make sure that when the word comes, that there's a return on investment, a ROI in my life. So that God can constantly invest in me, bless me, prosper me, so that I can bless and prosper others. What type of person are you? Are you the pathway person? Are you the rocky person? Are you the thorny person? Or are you the good soil person? Your life, your life will testify. Come let us pray. Father God of our Lord Jesus Christ, I come today with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, as I've shared this word, I want to thank you, Lord, that I had the privilege to 
Share it with your children. But I pray, Lord, that the word will go forth right now and not return void, but that there will be a harvest on this word, that it will fall onto fertile ground. And Lord, Father God, that it will produce a harvest, 30, 60, 100 fold in return. Lord, give us discernment to know where we are, to know where we need to change, where we need to adapt, improve, grow, so that we can be fruitful for your kingdom, my Lord. Bless every one of us with that discernment. Give us the wisdom, Lord, so that when we receive the word, that we don't just listen to it, but that we hear it and understand the word. I pray for a blessing upon every single person that receives this word tonight. Not because I'm preaching it, but because it's the word of God. Lord, so that this word can become a manifestation in their lives. So that they can have their harvest. So that they can glorify and boast about the goodness of God. We give you all the glory and honor for this moment that we could share together. I pray right now in Jesus' name. Bless us. Watch over us. Have your hand upon us. Amen. I want to invite you, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, or you've been backslidden in your faith, and you know you're not where you're supposed to be. Don't you want to make right with God? Don't you want to give your heart to Jesus? It's quite simple. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your lips and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. You just have to pray a prayer. Call out to God. Mean it from your heart. And the Bible says that's where salvation begins. So, don't you want to pray this prayer with me? Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I admit that I'm a sinner. And I admit that I need a Savior. I confess, Jesus, that you died on the cross. And I confess, Jesus, you rose from the grave. I give you my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, I believe you've received the gift of salvation. Get into a good Bible-based church. Keep God first place. Read the Bible. Listen to what your pastor says. You know, listen to good anointed preaching. Not just doctrine, but the word of God. Listen to the word of God. Ask yourself, is it in God's word? And listen to it. And let it speak and minister to you. And as you spend time also in prayer, as you do this, you will see the hand of God. You will experience the good of, goodness of God. It doesn't mean that you won't have problems. But it means in spite of the problems, in spite of the storms and the circumstances of life that might come against you you will be blessed and prosperous just like the man just like that person in psalm chapter one that will be like a tree planted along river banks you will be able to yield a harvest for god's kingdom i'll leave you with that thought tonight god bless you i want to quickly greet everybody that's online and say welcome to everybody that's watching jeanette Crea, it's good to have you online Ruth Silberman, my biological mother, it's good to have you online. God bless you. Sean Skitarotto, it's good to have you online. Lisa Crea, welcome. Marie Wilder, it's good to have you online. God bless you. Sean Skitarotto says, once the understanding comes, in the revelation comes, and the change comes from the inside. Yes, when the revelation comes, it needs to fall in your heart, and it needs to manifest in change. Amen. Thank you, John. Lente Furi, welcome. It's good to have you. Hendriet, it's good to have you online. Salumi Fulun, God bless you. It's good to have you online. Antoinette Fleece, it's good to have you online. Welcome. Joey Willifeer, God bless you. Salumi Fulun says, Bye, Var, ons moet net nederig blij. Is net Godse genade wanneer die mens geseen word. Ek bly eerder net soos ek is en vertrouw God. Okay. What Salome is saying, we must stay humble. And it's only by God's grace that we can be blessed. And she says, I will stay the way that I am and trust in God. 
What I mean, what I think you mean by that is she's not going to allow the world to change her, but that she's going to stay who she is by the grace of God. I think that's the context of what Salome was saying. I believe it because I, I understand her like that. Amen. Erika Lamarti. I hope I'm saying it right. Welcome. It's good to have you online. Hetty Kutsia, welcome. It's good to have you online. Madeleine van der Westhuizen, welcome. Sharon Jackals, it's good to have you online. I trust that you and your husband are doing well. God bless you both. Please send regards to your husband, Sharon. It's really good to see you guys online. What a pleasant surprise. Henry Bridger, it's good to see you online. Bernard Brophy, it's good to have you online. God bless you. Jody Kreer, welcome. It's good to have you online. Anna Steenkamp, good to have you online. Andre Loschberg, it's good to have you online. Amen. Well, thank you to all of you that have taken the time to watch. That's all that I have for tonight. You must have a wonderful evening, a good night's rest, and may God bless you. And I'll see you Wednesday night here on Facebook at 7 o'clock with our live midweek broadcast to share the word of God with you. Have a wonderful evening. This is Pastor Dominique signing out.